everyone from 84 to 89, I was the chair of the Pollution Advisory Committee of Birds of the Earth. Uh, at that time, I was a new appointed consultant working in the NHS. My field was dermatology. So I came to the nuclear debate rather by accident. I had no particular agenda, and I wasn't being paid anything by Friends of the Earth. Um, However, it was clear that there were two major health issues uh, permeating the nuclear debate at that time. This is certainly the cost of disposing of the current stockpile of nuclear waste at Sutterfield is 67 billion pounds. Uh, one of the concerns was the observation that there were clusters of childhood leukemia in the vicinity of the only two reprocessing facilities in the UK, that is Dubray and Sutterfield. Uh, the second issue was the latest uh, follow-up data on the atomic bomb survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki were showing cancer rates that were much higher than the international safety standards allowed at that time. In other words, the number of cancers or deaths from a given dose of radiation uh, needed to be four or five times higher than the official estimates. Uh, in order to try and achieve some sort of consensus on these two issues, I organized a conference at the Hammersmith Hospital in 1986 on the biological effects of ionizing radiation. Uh, I invited Sir Richard Southwood to chair it. Uh, he was a professor of zoology at Oxford. He chaired the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which looked at lead in the environment, and I knew him from that inquiry. Uh, he was also, more usefully, the chair of the National Radiological Protection Board, so he was actually advising the government on radiation standards. He went on to become vice chancellor of Oxford University. Anyway, the conference was uh, quite successful. Uh, here I am with three of the great, the great three greats from radiobiology, Alice Stewart from the UK, uh, who demonstrated the extreme sensitivity of the human fetus to ionizing radiation. Uh, Professor Ed Radford on the right, uh, who was chair of the BR3 committee in America, that's the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation Committee. And Professor Carl Morgan in the middle, who was the first president Health Physics Society in 1955, and in fact was editor of the journal Health Physics until 1977. Uh, sadly, no one in this photograph is still alive apart from me. I expect Rosatom would like to do something about that. So Richard and I uh, edited and published the conference proceedings. The book was called Radiation and Health, Biological Effects of Low-Level Exposure ionizing radiation. Um, the NRPB accepted the implications of the new atomic bomb data. Radiation standards were tightened, not only in the UK but worldwide. Coincidentally, this made life more difficult for the nuclear industry. It meant that allowable annual exposures for nuclear workers went down and the costs went up. Uh, the CGB had planned to build 32 nuclear reactors in the 1980s. In the event, only one was actually built, the size of LB. The second issue, that of leukemia clusters, remains unresolved. Uh, I don't want to get into the debate today, as it's quite complicated, but there's a lack of data supporting the dose response effect. Clusters of childhood leukemia have been noted around other nuclear facilities where the nuclear discharges are much lower than they are from Sellafield or even Dunray. And clusters have also been noted around non nuclear. Power stations. This led uh, investigators in this field to postulate what's known as the Kinman hypothesis, whereby populations of workers who migrate to a new location to build power stations intermix viruses, one of which might be leukemogenic. Uh, certainly, HTLV1 is a leukemogenic virus, but that's not prevalent in the UK. No one's identified what the particular virus might be, uh, but it's generally accepted amongst researchers that this is the best explanation we have. Time. Or if it is not a single virus, then it is an abnormal immune response to one or more common infections, uh, viral or bacterial, in susceptible individuals. Professor Greed is the sort of guru of uh, childhood leukemia in the UK. So, what are the outstanding health issues today? 
Well, they relate to nuclear accidents and how many people who develop cancer and die as a result of a major nuclear accident. The nuclear industry claim a major accident rate of one per million years. The reality is rather more sobering. Uh, if we just consider nuclear, civil nuclear reactors, we've had four. Wind scale in 56, later renamed Sutterfield, Three Mile Island in 79, Chernobyl in 86, and Fukushima in 2011. Four accidents, one of which could have contaminated New York, and one of which could have wiped out Tokyo. These are not exactly backward countries with antiquated technology. The nuclear industry has about 400 reactors worldwide, and they have approximately 15,000 years of operating experience. So we're looking at an accident rate, not of one in a million years, but one every 4,000 years, which means that with 400 reactors worldwide, you can expect a major accident every decade. If we build another 400 nuclear reactors, then we will see a major accident every five years. Now, some countries may be willing to sustain this level of risk. I'm not sure it's a good idea in Britain, a small island with a very dense population. The consequences of a major accident in the UK don't really bear thinking about, which of course is why the fast breeder reactor was built up in New Ray on the northern tip of Scotland, which is as far away from a large population centre as it's possible to get and still be on the UK mainland. The second aspect of nuclear activity we need to consider is this. What is the real cancer risk from exposure to ionising radiation? I already mentioned that the atomic bomb survivor data has led to the tightening of radiation standards within the nuclear industry. However, the majority of those who died following the explosions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were burnt alive, and 15 to 20% died from acute radiation sickness. Long-term follow-up of the atomic bomb survivors showed that out of 9,335 cancer deaths in a population of 86,000, 5% of the solid cancers and a third of the leukemias were attributed to radiation exposure. Perhaps more important, there are no inherited defects identified in subsequent generations. Dropping nuclear devices on civilian populations is one way to obtain experimental data on ionizing radiation, and the events at Hiroshima and Nagasaki has provided the most reliable and robust data in terms of radiation and cancer risk, and the effect of ionizing radiation on subsequent what about Chernobyl? This picture was taken four hours after the accident from a helicopter that flew into the reactor. The picture is hazy because of the extremely high levels of radiation. The only proven radiological effect of the releases from Chernobyl has been an increase in thyroid cancer in those who were children at the time of the accident. The increase is rapid and is still measurable today, though the level of thyroid cancer in those children born after 87 is now back to normal as radioactive iodine disappeared from their environment. Thyroid cancer is very amenable to treatment, and only about 1% eventually die of their disease. So of approximately 6,000 cases diagnosed since Chernobyl in 86, only 15 have proved fatal. The figure might have been even lower were it not for the fact that the population around Chernobyl was relatively iodine depleted, and measures to limit the exposure of the surrounding population were not put in place rapidly. What about Fukushima? Releases of radiation from Fukushima were very much lower than those that were emitted from Chernobyl. In the case of cesium, approximately one quarter. Uh, furthermore, the Japanese government took measures more rapidly to limit the exposure of the surrounding population who were relatively iodine replete. Because of the experience with Chernobyl, the Japanese have launched an extensive monitoring program to screen exposed children, with regular checks every two years until the age of 20 and every five years thereafter it is quite possible that no significant increase in thyroid cancer will be detected in the exposed Fukushima pediatric population. So why do people worry so much about exposure to ionizing radiation after a nuclear accident? Well, the first problem is the perception of dangers that you cannot measure. When a large population is exposed to a small dose of radiation, it is assumed, using the low threshold linear model of ionizing that that produces the same effect as a smaller number of people being exposed to a high level of radiation. Now, whether this is true or not, I don't think anyone can prove. But if you multiply a large population by small doses of radiation, 
you come up with figures that 5 to 10,000 people died as a result of Chernobyl from cancer. Now, you cannot actually identify who those people are, but it has to be assumed that somewhere in the European population, people died from cancer as a result of Chernobyl that otherwise would not have died. So that is the first concern, the unseen danger. The second concern is more pertinent, and it is this. How close were those accidents to a complete meltdown? In the case of Fukushima, it was touch and go as to whether um, uh, people, the, as to whether Tokyo was contaminated. Were it not for the heroism of the Japanese workers who went back into the plant and exposed themselves to high levels of radiation to keep the water supply going to cool the reactor, there would have been a major explosion, and most of the island of Japan would have been contaminated. This aerial photo was taken by a small unmanned drone on March 24, 2011. Uh, this is damage unit three, can be seen after the explosion. So this is the issue that we need to deal with when we contemplate building a new generation of nuclear reactors. Particularly when the company is vying to take over the, nuclear, the UK's nuclear building program are Rosatom from Russia and a Chinese consortium. Russia and China are not countries that are exactly renowned for their safety record, their concern for public health, their immunity to corruption or human rights. Anyway, it gives a whole new meaning to the film, The China Syndrome. One other thing should be considered about building nuclear power stations. They need cooling, so they're either built on rivers or by the sea. As climate change worsens, rivers will dry up and plants will become redundant. This has already happened in France, where three nuclear power stations on the Loire were put out of commission uh, in 2009 due to the drought. Secondly, plants by the sea are built on or near the beach, witness Fukushima. So what happens when sea levels rise? They will either become unusable or, more worrying, downright dangerous. So I'm not convinced that nuclear power is the answer to Britain's energy needs. Finally, I want to say a few words about subsidies. Apostles of the nuclear industry, such as Sir Ian Fells, is always prattling on about the upfront costs of renewable energy. So what about the nuclear industry? Subsidising construction costs is not the only way that HMG supports the nuclear industry to the detriment of renewables. The official estimate for disposing of our current stockpile of nuclear waste in this country alone stands at just over £100 billion. In addition, one has to factor in that HMG has acquiesced to the outrageous demand by EDF and Centrica that taxpayers underwrite the medical costs arising from the nuclear accident in the UK. I have absolutely no doubt that Russia and China will make the same demands, and the coalition may well be silly enough to agree. The nuclear industry like to argue that a major nuclear accident is a remote possibility, but as I've said, experience suggests otherwise, with four major accidents involving civil reactors in the past 50 years. As I've already said, the consequences of a major accident in the UK don't bear thinking about. Uh, the fast breeder at Dune Ray is as far away from a large population as you can get. It too has consumed several billions of pounds in subsidy over the past 57 years and has never managed to operate commercially. No other civil industry in the history of the world has had that level of public subsidy. If ever the true costs of nuclear power were properly identified, then it would be seen as an astronomically expensive option compared with every other form of power generation, and that includes renewables.